Most Americans don't know why Oklahoma has this strange panhandle. What could be going on here that's so important to where Oklahoma needed this land? Well, actually, this strip of land used to be one of the most violent parts of the country where all crimes were legal, but this didn't just happen all overnight. The first people to have been recorded living in this Oklahoma panhandle region were the Native Americans, specifically those part of the Comanche, Kiowa, and Cheyenne tribes. These tribes had long called the area home and lived in harmony with the land and buffaloes that roamed the Great Plains. But when the Europeans showed up and eventually began moving westward, these natives unfortunately didn't stand much of a chance. In 1803, the United States made a massive land purchase from France known as the Louisiana Purchase. This this land acquisition included a vast area of land that would eventually establish the early border of Oklahoma and many other states' borders in this region began forming as well. The Kansas-Nebraska Act established their land just north of the 37th parallel, which also later included Colorado to stay north of this 37th degree parallel. The land where the present-day Oklahoma panhandle is was actually owned by the Republic of Texas, which was its own country established in 1836. By 1845, Texas was seeing how rich and prosperous the United States was and decided it would be better to end the Republic and become an American state. The only problem was, slavery was legal in Texas and their borders stretched above the 36 and a half parallel line where slavery was not allowed. Back when the Missouri Compromise was signed in 1820, this made slavery illegal north of the 36 and a half parallel line and legal south of this line. Since Texas stretched above this line, they were going to have to make the decision as to whether they were going to give up their slaves or forfeit the land. Texas decided slaves were more important than this 34 mile wide stretch of land, so Texas agreed on a northern border running along the 36 and a half degree parallel. That left this 2 million acre stretch of land completely unclaimed and later known as no man's land. Not much was going on here in no man's land up until a man named James Lane had a vision for this region in 1880. James built a sod house on the banks of the Beaver River. He then opened a trading post and makeshift hotel inside the sod house to attract visitors. Cattlemen, traders, farmers, and freighters all heard of this news and came into the Beaver River area to see what James was building. The Native Americans that were still living in this region didn't like this, so they tried taxing James and the others staying with him, but since nobody technically owned the land, the natives were unsuccessful. In 1883, a post office was established near James's home with the name of Beaver City, and in 1886, the commissioner of the U.S. Land Office declared that the panhandle was public land, which allowed others to start coming in and building. This led to a massive surge of people coming to live in Beaver City, and with that, other small settlements began emerging. Beaver City soon had a saloon, church, drugstore, grocery store, lumberyard, and even an opera house. Cowboys and ranchers started coming into Beaver City during this time to get away from their families and wives. Because this land had no laws, there was a lot of degeneracy going on in the bars and brothels. The crime was starting to get out of hand in no man's land, where people known as road trotters would ride up to a sod house and tell the occupants that they had prior claim to the land, and if they did not pay them cash for the land, then the people living in the sod house would have to move. Most of the settlers in these sod houses paid the road trotters, never aware that nobody actually owned any of the land as the government declared the whole panhandle just public land. Nobody owned any of the homes that were being built and nobody owned any of the land, but this all soon needed to change. In 1889, the US decided they were going to have something called a land run. Because no man's land was becoming so popular, the US decided that Americans ought to own the land rather than having these road trotters coming through and stealing everybody's money. Although this land was still not owned by any one US state, the US decided to allow Americans to line up along the border of no man's land and then on April 18th, 1889, these people lined up on the border would be able to rush in and claim 160 acres of land as long as they ended up living on the land for five or more years. No man's land was too 
2 million acres, so theoretically, there were 12,500 plots open and ready to be claimed. This deal was originally part of the Homestead Act, where the United States was encouraging Americans to move west, but during this land rush in 1889 is when they opened the deal to include no man's land. Massive herds of people were settling in mostly the Kansas border towns of Arkansas City and Caldwell, which were right along the railroad, waiting for the green light to head into no man's land. In theory, the land rush was going to be monitored fully by the US military, however, the military didn't have quite enough people to have total surveillance over the perimeter of no man's land. Some people saw gaps in the surveillance and snuck into no man's land early in order to beat the rush and establish a good plot of land. These people that came in early were known as Sooners, and the Boomers were the ones who were attempting to come in through the land rush legally, hence the famous Oklahoma phrase, Boomer Sooner. As soon as noon approached, on April 22nd, the estimated 50,000 people that surrounded no man's land were finally able to run in. It was a very dramatic moment, as when the clock struck noon, starting signals were given at many points of entry. In some cases, the green light was given by a military officer firing his pistol, or by his trumpeteer sounding his horn, or even at Fort Reno by the boom of the cannon. All produced the same results, a massive avalanche of wagons and horsemen surging forward all in one breathtaking instant. Families that remained behind at the line cheered as a husband or father made his wild dash to claim his 100 60 acres. The husband or father would immediately plant a stake at the closest open plot of land which had his name and location on it, declaring the land as his. Some would immediately begin making improvements to the land, such as digging a well or arranging logs for a potential home, while others would hurry to the land office to register their land. Out of the projected 12,500 potential plots of land to be settled on, an estimated 11,000 homesteads were claimed on just April 22nd alone. Now towns were popping up overnight, and it wasn't long before it came clear that this strip of land was going to need some kind of governance to maintain law and order. In 1890, for the first time since Texas gave up this land, no man's land finally belonged to a U.S. territory when the Oklahoma Organic Act was passed, creating the Oklahoma Territory and incorporating the Panhandle into it. The Panhandle kept growing, and by 1907, Oklahoma's Panhandle had over 32,000 residents living in it, which is actually more than what the Panhandle has today. Also in this year, Oklahoma transitioned from a territory to an official U.S. state. Things were going well in the Oklahoma Panhandle panhandle, that was, until the 1930s. As this Oklahoma panhandle was growing their economy, farmers were plowing the lands in the early 1900s so that one day they could plant crops. As the land got plowed, it transitioned from grassy plains to essentially just dirt, ready to be cultivated. In the 1930s, this became a major problem where this region started undergoing a severe drought. Not only could the farmers not plant any crops on the land they just plowed because they weren't getting any rainfall, but now all this dirt was getting extremely dry and exposed to the wind. And Anytime the wind blew, this dirt would fly up in the air and create massive dust storms. It was said that dirt in Colorado was making its way all the way to Washington, D.C. Animals died without enough crops to feed them, and the price of food was skyrocketing. Without any crops or animals to sell, the prairie farmers had no money to pay the banks back, and as a result, they lost their farms and homes. This disaster became known as the Great Dust Bowl, which destroyed much of the economy in this region. Today, the Oklahoma panhandle still exists, but it doesn't seem like the economy ever fully recovered, considering today in 2023, the panhandle has less people than it did in 1907 when Oklahoma first became a state. The median household income for the panhandle is just $34,000, which is significantly lower than the U.S. median household income at $74,580. The land is pretty empty, but there's still signs in physical history that show what this land once was. This is similar to California, where the United States' largest lake once was. Although this lake completely dried thousands of years ago, this past winter, the lake started forming again, and you can find out exactly why in this video right here. 